Good evening, friends. I'm Reverend Cole Gramble, minister at Selkirk United Church. I'd like to welcome you to our annual Coping with Grief service, also known as our Celebration of Life service. As you can see this year, our service, like so many other things in 2020, is different. No gathering in our sanctuary. So we bring this service to you like all of our other services since March online. I hope that this change doesn't make it more difficult. We can't reach out and hold a hand or give a hug this year or sit together around a sanctuary, but I hope you know that you are not alone tonight. There are many others gathered with us online, taking part in this service, joining in community, becoming a community. We may not be able to see each other's faces, but I hope you know that none of us face this service alone or this season. Just like none of us face our losses or our grief alone, we have each other for support, for compassion, for comfort, and for hope. So welcome, and peace be with each of you. We begin every service by lighting our rainbow candle, which symbolizes that we are an affirming congregation and that all are welcome. I would like to thank a few other people for their part in tonight's service. First of all, Charlene Barker, who has offered music for our service, as well as Chris Uzdebski, who has put the service together and made it available online for all of you. Thank you. As I said, we may gather as individuals tonight, but at the same time, all of us are connected, both to those we are remembering here tonight, but also to one another. We are a supportive community tonight, able to grieve as one, to remember as one, to hold each other up in spirit, and even to celebrate the lives of those we will remember. Tonight I am going to light some other candles, and I'm going to read the names of some of your loved ones out loud, and we're going to have a time of quiet remembrance. And then some more music to end our time together. So again, welcome to this space and this time. I'm glad you found us. I'd like to begin by inviting you into a time of quiet reflection as we invite the spirit of healing, the spirit of hope, to be with us tonight. Let us pray. Life-giving spirit, we gather here tonight seeking peace, seeking comfort, hoping to find strength and support during this time. May our hearts be open to receiving those things, either through a word or through a song, perhaps by the light of a candle, or the knowledge that there are others here with us across the miles or just across town, but here with us nonetheless. May loneliness be eased during this time together. May fears be released. May hope be revived. And may each of us be given the strength needed to carry on in the days and weeks to come. Amen. As I said, I'm going to light some candles tonight and tell some stories. Candles can be a powerful symbol for us, light in the darkness that sometimes seems to surround us. In many churches, candles are lit at this time of year to symbolize hope, peace, joy, and love. Yesterday, during our Selkirk United Online service, we lit the first and second purple candles, which symbolize hope and peace. We really need hope and peace in our world right now, and we certainly all need hope and peace in our lives tonight and in the days to come. Here this evening, our candles are going to symbolize some different words and thoughts and emotions. I'm going to borrow a few of those Advent words and add some others too. Like the first Advent candle, our first candle will also be for hope. John Moses wrote these words about hope. What does hope feel like? Hope feels like the first warm day of spring. You know it will get cold again, but summer will come. Hope feels like a door that has always been locked and barred, moving when you push it. It may only move a little bit, and you may wonder if you have the strength to open it, but the barrier has become a possibility. 
Hope feels like an encouraging word just when you thought you couldn't go on any longer. What is it like to live in hope? Hope always looks up, always strains to see the first glimmer of light along the horizon. Hope always listens, always listens to the angel voices of kindness and mercy. Hope doesn't believe the haters and the doomsayers. Hope trusts, hope believes. Let's light the candle of hope. The other day I heard a story I hadn't heard before. It's a tragic story to be sure, but it's also a story that shows how connected we are. I told part of this story in my online message this past week, but I wanted to repeat it tonight in more detail for this service. It's a historical story, but I'd like to share this version of it written by Sarith Gardner. It's titled, The Bittersweet Reason Boston Receives a Christmas Tree from Nova Scotia Every Year. Gardner writes, 103 years ago, tragedy brought out the very best in these North American neighbors. On December 6, 1917, as local children busily prepared for Christmas and the city's people went about their day, two ships collided in the Halifax Harbor in Nova Scotia. At first, people were unaware of the danger that was about to come. However, this historic event would affect the lives of thousands and create a bond between Nova Scotians and Bostonians for over a century. Many people outside of Nova Scotia have not heard the story of the Halifax explosion. But one of the beautiful things to rise from the ashes of that tragedy was the way communities and neighbors right across national borders came together. One of the ships carried relief supplies being sent to Belgium to help in their war efforts. But the other ship had 2.9 kilotons of explosives. Passers-by, including many children, ran to the harbor to witness what was going on, unaware that the black smoke coming from the ships was only a small sign of what was to come. One man, Vince Coleman, realized the ensuing danger. While encouraging others to flee the area, he stopped to send a message warning a train full of passengers making their way to the harbor of the impending danger. His act of courage saved the passengers, but Coleman lost his own life. The explosion killed 2,000 and wounded 9,000 more. It was the largest man-made explosion to ever happen until the atomic bomb. When a blizzard arrived the following day, 25,000 people were left without shelter. British sailors nearby joined the Canadian military to help, and a U.S. naval ship, the USS Tacoma, headed straight to the area after they felt the blast from 52 miles away. In Boston, Governor Samuel McCall heard limited details of the tragedy. Although he sent a telegram offering help, he quickly understood that he and his fellow Bostonians had to step in immediately. He sent a letter to this effect to the mayor of Halifax, explaining that Massachusetts would be sending their surgeons and nurses and further help, even though they'd heard no further developments from the destroyed city. The letter apparently moved the mayor to tears. The help extended beyond the medical professionals. Bostonians raised what would be $1.9 million today within one hour. Further fundraising gathered a total of the equivalent of $15 million. Thanks to the aid of their Bostonian neighbors, many of whom stayed on to help rebuild the city and tend to the wounded, Halifax began a slow path of recovery. The evergreen tree sent each year now to Boston Common from Nova Scotia is just one symbol of everlasting gratitude that the Nova Scotians wish to express to their neighbors. Out of such a tragedy, Neighbors did what they do best for each other in times of need, lend support and aid with no expectation of anything in return. 
I said earlier that it's a story of how connected we are, and that's true. But it's also a story about coming to the aid of others during their times of need. It's a story about loss, but also about courage, about helpers. A story about kindness. And if you think about the annual gift of the Christmas tree with its evergreen boughs, it's also a story of life and new life. Evergreen represents eternal life. So let's light a candle for all of these themes. Courage, helpers, support, kindness, life, and eternal life. Our next candle is for that mixture of joy and sorrow that accompanies so many of our memories of loved ones. A colleague of mine lost her partner about three years ago now. I'm not going to share her whole story, that's hers to tell. But I do want to share a few lines that she wrote about her experience of loss. She shared these words in an article that she wrote two years after her partner's death. She wrote, Grief manifests in different ways. Some days it's a lump in my solar plexus, like a fist that landed and stayed. I have been surprised by this, smacked down by its intensity even still. Every so often I remember to deepen my breath, to breathe through it. I spent last Canada Day on a west coast island with views looking over the water, perfect summer weather and foxglove and daisies everywhere. In the midst of all that beauty, I realized joy and sorrow are not opposites. They are here together, companionably having tea, inviting me to sit and drink in both the gladness and anguish, because both speak to what is precious. So what is precious in life? Thirty plus years of muddling through together, our child grown into a lovely young man. The music he shared and continues to share through recordings. Memories of him. And gratitude that he was here and we were lucky to be here with him. That we walked that final journey together, surrounded in love, surrounded by family, friends, and even strangers. His ashes beckon me to embrace more precious life because while he has vanished into a new journey, I continue mine here, bereft, but blessed. Let's light a candle for blessings, for memories, memories that sometimes bring sorrow, but can also bring joy and thankfulness. We light this next candle for something that is called the halo effect. The definition of the halo effect is the tendency for an impression created in one area to influence opinion in another area. That's the halo effect. And that can manifest itself in many things and in many ways. One of those ways was discussed by a United Church minister just a few weeks ago. She was talking about the services that faith communities provide that support the wider community, secular and otherwise. One of these things is ritual and support in times of grief. She said, faith communities such as mine are places where big questions, scary subjects, enormous emotions are not something to be feared, but something to be honored, to sit with, to sit in the silence when there are no words to feed each other, literally with potlucks and casseroles and trays of squares or cookies, and metaphorically, too, with hugs, holding hands, 
picking up groceries, driving someone to appointments that will have terrifying prognoses, being present with the lonely, all of these things and more. This time of season is when my faith tradition lights candles in a circle, she continues, one more each week as we approach the longest night. I will stand in my empty sanctuary in front of those candles this year and light the first one with only a camera to witness and say words about how we start with hope because hope is the only candle with enough strength to stand by itself in the darkness. And she concludes with these words, saying, the faith communities know how to accompany grief. We know how to embody hope. We know how ritual is crucial to processing life in its joys and in its sorrows. And when one of us helps another, it spreads. It's a halo effect. Compassion and care we show to one gets passed along to another and another and another. Healing is shared, strength grows, and peace comes. Slowly, perhaps, but it comes. Let's light a candle for this halo effect that we are all part of when we share compassion and care for one another. May it bring peace to you and to many. We have one last candle to light, and it is without a story, because we want you to make it your story, your own story. This candle is for you. May it give you light for your darkness, hope for your personal circumstances, and may it show you God's love. At this point in our service, I am going to read out the names of those that you have sent in that you are remembering at this time of year and always. Let's take a few moments in silence and then I will begin with the names. Earl Greer. Joe Smedorovac. Dale Iwanochko. Ernie and Myrtle Zero, John and Ann Iwanachko, Roly Cameron, Dean Cameron, George Cox, Maisie and Sherman Clark, Bob and Mary Cox, Phyllis Sawchin, Don Kaczkowski, Kurt Stone, Bert Olander, Rob Cox, Glenn Green, Mary Cox, Bob Erickson, Crawford and Alma McMillan, Ken Hardy, Archie and Evelyn, Dave Wilson, Amy Rebecca Richards, May, Clyde Reed. All the families who have lost a loved one to COVID-19 and all those who are struggling with loss throughout our whole world. It 
Let's take a few moments in silent reflection as we remember these whom we have named and others. As our service ends, our support for one another remains. Peace be with you. Peace and compassion and support and hope. May all of these things be with you as your journey continues. And do remember, you do not journey alone. Peace be with you. Amen.